In the book of Revelation, time is, shall we say, elastic. Um, there are passages where it's obvious we're dealing with the past, passages where it's obvious that we're dealing with John's present, and times when it's obvious we're dealing with the future, but there are other times where we're not sure. And there are other times, other passages where everything kind of all mingles together. Today's chapter is one of those situations where everything mingles together. Actually, it's not a chapter we're going to look at today, but a passage, the last half of 11 and then into chapter 12. 11, 15 to 12, 17 is what we'll be looking at today. And it's, um, it's a fascinating little uh, segment that we're going to be looking at four, four pictures. We're going to look at the blowing of the seventh trumpet. We're going to look at a, a, an amazing um, pl uh, play that's kind of played out before us. Uh, that tells us about past, present, and future with a woman, a child, and a dragon. Yes, the only place where we got a dragon in the Bible, and it's not a literal dragon, it's symbol, it's in Revelation. We'll tell you what that means when we get there. Uh, this hymn of triumph that God himself sings, amazingly, and then uh, a little bit of conversation about the Great Tribulation. So a lot going on in today's passage. It's kind of like a puzzle that you got to piece together, and we'll try to do our best with it. So let's take a look at it uh, by beginning with verse 15 of chapter 11. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Does that sound familiar, like to anybody who's listened to, you know, music by Handel during Christmas, right? That, that's, that's, that's part of the Hallelujah chorus, right? So this is the seventh, the blowing of the seventh trumpet. And I want to remind you of the picture we drew earlier about the bowls, the trumpets, the seals. Remember? The seals open up the scroll when the seventh seal is opened, which we saw already, out come seven trumpets. When the seventh trumpet is blown, we will see soon out coming seven bowls. But right now we're going to get a picture of, of that kind of contextualizes all of this for us. So it's kind of like this idea of fireworks. So all of this still is contained within the seventh seal because all of the trumpets are contained within the seventh seal. So, so all of this is still part of the reclamation of the earth that's contained in the scroll. So it's just, just a reminder of the context, and all of it is within the second vision that John is receiving, John being at the entrance to heaven, the entrance to the throne room of heaven at this point. So the seventh trumpet will announce God's complete possession of the earth. Remember, the scroll is the title deed to the earth. Each seal opens a little bit more of it. The seventh opens the last part of it. It will introduce soon, as we'll see, the bowls of wrath. Uh, and then when the final one will be the final occupation of the earth, this is God's final possession of the earth. Uh, have you ever rented an apartment or bought a, a house, right? There's a point at which you take possession of it, and there's another point at which you occupy it, right? So this, the thing is signed, and at that point, hey, we own the house. We're not living in it yet. You still have to move in. The, the last seal, the last trumpet announces God's possession of the earth. At this point, God now owns the earth and can do with it what he wants. He has taken it back into his authority. He possesses it at the end of this, uh, at the end of, not the end of this, but qu quite a few uh, chapters still in with the final pouring of the seventh bowl. So we're still in this in-between thing. With the seventh trumpet, he now has authority over everything on the earth. He has not yet come back to it. The second coming has not yet occurred. He has not yet taken occupation of it, but he owns it. I know that's, it sounds like wordplay. It sounds like we're, we're you know, splitting hairs here, but we're, it's not. It's important as to what goes on. This possession of the earth, this fact that the earth is now completely under Christ's authority, launches a celebration in heaven. And let's take a look at it. In verses 16 through 18. And the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. How do we know that this, this gives God possession of the earth? The, the ruling council of heaven says so. At this point, you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. You now own the earth again. Verse 18, the nations were angry and your wrath has come. That will happen with the pouring of the first bowl. We have now gone from announcing his coming wrath to the actual pouring of his wrath with the first bowl. 
The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and your people who revere your name, both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. So the seventh trumpet announces the beginning of the end of all earthly things. From Romans 8.22, we know that all of creation has been groaning, as, as that passage says, in pains, as in the pains of childbirth up until this time. All of creation is like, this is not how it's supposed to be. We are not supposed to be under the possession of who we are under possession of now, namely Satan and his minions. This earth was made to belong to God and to be under his authority. And so this is where the, the birth, that birthing takes place, where the possession takes place, where we now know that earth is under its rightful owner. This, however, means time for some serious cleaning. Again, if you've ever bought a house, until you officially have possession, you're not allowed to go into that house and tear out a wall or even paint or even clean up. Once you have taken possession of it and it's yours, why don't you move in right away? Because usually there's some work to do before it's occupiable, right? Especially if you bought a fixer-upper. Well, Jesus is buying a fixer-upper. <laughs> okay, Take a look around the world today. This is a fixer-upper because we broke it. The, the current renters of this facility have caused a mess. So when Jesus takes his possession, he doesn't move in right away because there's a whole lot of cleanup to do. Um, we, we, this is this is actually the answer to Revelation chapter 6, verse 10, where the question was asked, how long, O Lord, until you avenge? This is the announcement of the beginning of the avenging. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 says, then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. So Jesus now owns the earth at this point, at the blowing of the seventh trumpet. He now has to destroy all of the dominions, authorities, and powers that have been ruling this earth so that he can clean it out for the final possession, for the final, um, not for the final possession, but for the final occupation of it by, by God, by Christ, uh, and by uh, us as we come back uh, to, to reclaim the earth again on behalf of, uh, of what Jesus has done. This will culminate the final uh, occupation of the earth will happen with the Battle of Armageddon, which we have a few more chapters to get to. But I know, complex, but that's where we're going so far. Now, uh, we move from there to verse 19. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the Ark of his Covenant. Yeah, the one from, right, the Raiders movie, right? And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a severe hailstorm. We've seen those kinds of imagery before, a lot of it reminiscent of the plagues in Egypt, right? But what's interesting to me here is this is uh, the second of three of four openings in Revelation. The, the first opening in Revelation is that a door to heaven is open. That began the uh, second vision, the one that we're now in. This is the second opening. God's temple is open and he sees the Ark of the Covenant. Still to come in a few chapters in chapter 15 is that the, the tabernacle of the testimony is open. And then finally in chapter 19, verse 11, heaven itself is open. It's a progression of moving closer and closer and closer to the center of things. Now, tabernacle of the testimony, that's the first time we've heard that. We've heard the word tabernacle before, but never with the words of the testimony attached to it. So what is that? We'll get into that detail when it's open in chapter 15, but let's just say for now it's the inner court where the Ten Commandments was. Here he sees the ark. He's not in there yet. He sees the ark. The next opening will be the actual uh, opening of God uh, of it with thunderings and everything else. So there are thunderings, there's an earthquake, there's a hailstorm, but the ark is primarily a symbol of God's merciful presence. And we'll see that again when we get to the tabernacle of the testimony. So this is the second of four openings in heaven. We now go, get finally into chapter 12. Let's take a look. We're going to read a big chunk of it, verses 9 through 7. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. Its, its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment uh, he was born. She gave birth 
uh, yeah, there we go. She gave birth to a son, a male child who will quote, who quote, will rule all the nations with an iron scepter, close quote. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. That's a number we've heard before, right? Verse 7. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with them. So we've got this amazing story uh, with these images of the woman, the child, and the dragon in verses 1 through 9. This is now a break between the trumpets and the bowls. The seventh trumpet has blown. The bowls will come out from that. But until that story is told, this is happening here. Okay? So there are three figures here. And twice in verses 1 and 3, twice it says that these figures are a sign. Now, the word sign is used a lot in the Bible. For instance, when Jesus told the parables, he said the parables were a sign. What is a sign? A sign points to a thing. A sign is not the thing itself, right? If you're going to travel to Grand Canyon and you get to the entrance of the park where it says, Welcome to Grand Canyon National Park, we always get out and take a picture of the sign, right? But can you imagine going to Grand Canyon, seeing the sign, taking a picture of the sign, and then going home and saying, We saw Grand Canyon. Why? Because we saw the sign. No, a sign means it's, it's, it's still to come. You're on the right track. Well, these three here say they're a sign. They are not the thing itself. They are a sign of the thing itself, which leads us to believe that these are definitely not literal. They are symbols for something else. They point to the thing. So let's take a look at these three symbols. Here they are, the dragon, the child, and the woman. And let's take a look at them um, in the order that they are most easily explained, okay? So the dragon, first of all, uh, and you can see how it's laid out here. You may want to take a um, a picture of this, t t take a screenshot of this, because there's a lot of information on this screen right now. So uh, here's what we know about the dragon. In verse 3, that it's red, that it has seven heads, which signifies intelligence. We've seen that before. Ten horns. Horns always symbolize power. Seven crowns. Crowns symbolize authority. Okay? The, in chapter, verse 4, uh, that it swept one-third of the stars with it, and that it's against the child. Verse 7, that it went, had a war with Michael, uh, that it lost that war to Michael in, in chapter verse 8. And in verse 9, that it was sent to the earth and is called the devil or Satan. Well, this is the easiest one because at the end, it tells you what the symbol is. This is Satan, okay? It says so in the passage. At the very end, what's going on here? Oh, the dragon is Satan. So the dragon is simply a symbol, a, a symbol that is used to describe who Satan is. Now, let's take a look at who the child is. Child is described in verse 5 as male, that he will rule the nations, and that he sits on God's throne. We know from Psalm 2.9 and Psalm 4.9 who that is. That's another very obvious one. Obviously, we're talking about Jesus here. The challenge is number three, and this is the one that good scholars will disagree on, so let me give you my best take on it. The woman, verse 1, says the woman is clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet. In Genesis 37, verses 9 through 10, you've got Joseph's dream. In Joseph's dream, this is how his brothers, the eventual heads of the 12 tribes of Israel, are described. You can go back and you can look at that. The, 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 the sun and moon and stars bowed down to him in his dream. Remember that? So, And it says there are 12 stars, which again, there were 12 tribes of Israel. Verse 2, that, he gave, uh, that she gave birth to the son in pain. Uh, Isaiah 66, 7 says that the Messiah will be given birth to by the nation of Israel in great pain. Verse 5, that she gave birth to a son. And verse 6, that he wandered in the wilderness for three and a half years. James 5, 17 uh, talks about Elijah uh, stopping the rain for uh, three, I'm sorry, not the wilderness, the, the uh, stopping of the rain. Yeah, sorry, it is. Wandering in the wilderness for three and a half years. Anybody else got uh, got quarantine brain? I definitely do. Um, uh, so wandered in the wilderness for three and a half years. Three and a half years we see in Scripture. In James, there's a reference to Elijah stopping the rain for three and a half years. In Revelation 1-2, we already saw a reference to that as well. 
When you add all of that up together, all of these are Jewish symbols. All of these are symbols of Israel. This here is Israel. That is, there's some debate over that because the images aren't as clear. The dragon is Satan. That's not a question. That's there. The child is Jesus, obviously. The, a, a male who will rule the nations and sit at God's throne, obviously Jesus. But it seems to me, some people believe that the woman is uh, specifically the Virgin Mary. But there's nothing in the Bible that talks about her clothed with the sun or having the moon under her feet. There's a lot of iconography that shows that because of this. Um, but the 12, the 12 tribes uh, and, and the wilderness, there's no three and a half years in Mary's life that we're aware of. But all of that does apply to Israel. So I think what you've got here is a picture of the nation of Israel giving birth to Jesus, uh, Satan hating Jesus, and Satan going to war with Jesus um, uh, be, or, or in anticipation of Jesus. So I believe when you add all this together, this is a picture of Satan's fall and of Christ's victory over him. Now, also to take a look at these verses, if you go back and you take a look at verses 1 through 9, there's a past, present, and future going on here. And the best I can piece it together is this. Verses 1 through 4 and 7 through 9, so the beginning and the end of this passage, are talking about something that happened before the world created was created. It, it's past tense. Then, then the, the tense shifts. And in verse 5, giving birth to a son who will rule the nations with an iron scepter. That's a picture of Christ on earth. Uh, verse 6, the woman fleeing into to the wilderness for 1,260 days. That number of days is always part of the tribulation. So Christ on earth is verse 5. The tribulation is verse 6. But the rest of it, the beginning and the end of it, appears to be the best, the, the best understanding that the Bible gives us of why there are demon spirits, of why there's a devil. That Satan, Lucifer, was an angel of light that he rebelled, that he took a third of the en enemies with him. So that's why we understand that demons are fallen angels. They have supernatural power. Uh, they are rebel rebels against God's authority. Uh, most of where we get that picture is this passage. So if you read through it again with that understanding, you'll see all of that. It's, it's interesting, strange, and at times a little bit scary, but it doesn't have to be scary because greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. So... That appears to be the kind of what where the timing happens within this passage. Let's jump to the next passage now, verses 10 through 12. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. Now, pause for a moment. In the previous passage, it didn't say he'd been hurled down to hell. It said he'd been hurled down to the earth. That's another reason why we look at this previous, the previous verses, verses 1 through 9, as past history, because this is not what's still to come of Satan being sent into hell. This is Satan having been hurled to the earth, which is where currently today, as we sit here in the 21st century, where Satan rules. How do we know that? Well, because there's stuff like viruses. That's Satan's doing, okay? Uh, that's part of a fallen earth where Satan rules. Um, verse 11. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Here's why we don't need to be afraid. There's triumph here. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore, rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. So we have here a hymn of triumph. And it's interesting. Take a look at the very beginning of it. Chapter 12, verse 10 says this. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power of our kingdom of, of our God. This appears to be God himself singing a hymn of triumph for our ability to overcome Satan. This is a voice from heaven. So is God the Father, Son, God the Spirit? We don't know. But this appears to be a divine voice celebrating our ability to overcome Satan. And how do we overcome Satan? Here's what it tells us in that passage. We overcome Satan by three things. By the blood of the Lamb, which means we didn't do it, Jesus did it. By the word of our testimony, that is saying what Jesus did by, by living a, a life and by saying the words that go along with that. And when we have no fear of death. If we walk around in a constant panic about death, that is a victory for Satan. He wants us afraid of death. And, and by the way, if we're afraid of death, 
What does it say about our belief in the afterlife? Now, I, I, I'm, I'm uncertain about dying. There are certain things about the way I might die that might be painful or difficult that aren't exactly pleasant. But the idea that I will be absent from this earth it doesn't really scare me. It's, it's weird because it's uncertain. I've never been there. But there's no fear in that. There should not be fear in that. Believers in Jesus should not walk around terrified of our deaths because our death is going to usher us into the presence of Jesus. So every time we stand in the face of death and go, that's all you got, Satan? <laughs> we take him down a notch. And it all begins with the blood of the Lamb because of what Jesus did on the cross. So we see what Jesus did on the cross. We testify of it. We are not afraid of death like everybody else is. And when we do that, we live in victory over Satan. This is what Jesus did for us. We then move along to verse 13. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, this is back in the past when he was hurled to the earth, and so the earth is now a place of his occupation, uh, uh, he pursued the woman who had given birth to to the male child. Now, this is a mixing of timeline. Obviously, him, Satan pursuing the woman is what we have seen throughout all of history. Why is it that the Jewish people have been the most persecuted people in world history with not even a close second? I, it's, it's because they are the people that preserved God's word, that gave birth to Messiah, they are the chosen people, the children of Abraham. And because of that, the devil hates them the most. So he is always going to raise up enemies against them. The Jewish people have always been under attack from Satan. I believe this passage is the beginning of a conversation about the Great Tribulation, that during the Great Tribulation, it will be even harder for the Jewish people. And we'll see a little more of that in a moment as to why I believe that. Verse 14 tells us... Um, why this is taking place. Oh, actually, let, let me, the timeline. Why is the timeline mixed up here? Um, because we're in, th in the throne room of heaven. We're about to walk through all of the things that we are in the middle of walking through <clears throat> all of the judgments that are about to come upon the earth when Jesus retakes uh, uh, his possession of it and then eventually his occupation of it. But it's kind of like Okay, the best I've got is the Terminator movies. Sorry, and if you've never seen the Terminator movies, don't worry, the, the, the explanation will still work for you. <clears throat> uh, and if you've seen any time travel movie, if you've seen, read anything about time travel, even back to, you know, H.G. Wells or whatever, that's kind of what you've got here. We talked about this before. God lives in a place outside of time and space. So the best picture I've got of how to do that is that, you know, God writes the novel and we're in the middle, we're characters living in the middle of the novel. Uh, that doesn't mean we don't have choices, we don't have options, uh, but that's the best picture I've got. It, any picture of that will be incomplete. But to those living outside the novel, I want you to imagine that Satan picks up the novel and reads to the end and goes, oh no, this whole thing of Jesus dying and rising again, that is actually going to be trouble for me. And so it's kind of like he does a Terminator and goes back to kill the, the child before it's born, right? Like Sarah Connor in the Terminator movies, right? They, they send the Terminator back to kill Sarah Connor, who's going to be, right? Okay, yeah. You don't need to know the movie to understand what I'm talking about here. So you've got an interesting mix of time here because, again, that's not a perfect illustration of it. A bunch of theologians can argue against me on that one and they'll be right. But it's the best picture I've got in my head of kind of what's going on here, that the reason there has been a war against the Jewish people for all of history is because Satan has been trying to preempt what happened on the cross, and he was not successful at it. So let's take a look at what happens in the next verses. Um, let me go back. Yeah, there we go. Verse 14, the woman was given the two wings of an eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would take care, she would be taken care of for times, a time, times, and half a time out of the serpent's reach. So the Bible uses four different ways of saying three and a half years, and one of them is here. First of all, there are times where the Bible just simply says three and a half years. We see that in Luke 4.25, James 5.17. We've seen it already in Revelation. 42 months is another way of saying three and a half years. We saw that in a Re Revelation chapter 11, verse 4 last week. We see 1,260 days, which we've seen already in this passage and in previous passages. The other one that we're going to see, again, is time, a time, 
times and half a time. So a time, one, times, that's two, so two plus one, that's three, and half a time, three and a, can't do it with my fingers, right? A time, one, times two plus, so times plus, a, two times plus one time is three, plus a half a time, three and a half. We see that in Daniel, a couple of places, we see that um, in Revelation uh, here. And when we see that, uh, e each time that three and a half years is signified, the different ways that it is signified designate different reasons. So for instance, three and a half years in both of those references in Luke and James are a reference to no rain in Elijah's day. So three and a half years, it didn't rain. So that's how that's always used there. 42 months refers to a, t a time during the tribulation in which sin will have its impact during that first half of the tribulation. Uh, so the first half of the tribulation is typically referred to as 42 months. So three and a half years is a, is a reference to uh, Elijah and the stopping of the rain. 42 months typically is a reference to the first half of the tribulation. Uh, 1260 days is typically a reference to God's mercy during the first half of the tribulation. We've seen that a couple times. And a time, times, and half a time is an apocalyptic way of saying it. You'll notice the places where it's said in Daniel and Revelation, both in apocalyptic literature. And when that's said, a time, times, and half a time refers to the second half of the tribulation. This is a time also known as the Great Tribulation. So, Whenever you see a reference to a time, times, and half a time, it's a reference to the Great Tribulation. This is why, like you might be wondering, okay, three and a half years, 42 months, 1,260 days, a time, times, and half a time, they all mean three and a half years. Why don't the translators just change it to three and a half years? Because the original language doesn't say three and a half years. It says three and a half years, 42 months, 1,260 days, and a time, times, and half a time. And each one of those refers to different types of things. So it's a clue for us as to what particular era is being dealt with by the manner in which they count it. Interesting, right? At least it is to me. All right, we continue on with the Great Tribulation. And what we've already seen in this passage is that the Jewish people will endure great persecution during the Tribulation. Uh, the woman is given great eagles so that she might fly to the wilderness to be taken care of. Why? Because she's going to be attacked during the Great Tribulation. Uh, what are So what are the wings of an eagle? Let's take a look at it in uh, Exodus 19.4, for instance. Exodus 19.4 says this, You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Eagle's wings is always a symbol of God taking care of his people and getting them out of a place of tribulation. They were taken on eagle's wings where? Back in the Old Testament? To the desert. From Egypt to the desert. Here, she's taken where? To the desert on eagle's wings. So it's a reference to a, an escape from persecution, but not to the full promised land yet. And this is a picture again that every Jew at that time would have understood. Here's another example of that. Matthew 2, verses 14 through 15 referring to Mary and Joseph and Jesus. So he, he, Joseph, got up, took the child and his mother, Mary, during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. So there's a reference, several references in Scripture coming out of Egypt, about God rescuing them. And when you add those together, rescuing the child, Mary, eagle's wings, you put all of that together. What you've got is a picture here that God will have some place of protection for Jewish people during the Great Tribulation. It will not be easy. There will be great persecution. They will endure horrors, but there will be a place of escape as well. Then we move along from there to verses 15 through 17, still talking about the Great Tribulation. Then from his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. So the serpent, the devil, obviously, she's, the woman has been taken away on eagle's wings, Israel, to a place of protection, but the serpent still wants to attack her. So the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman, pursuing her into the desert with a flood to sweep her away with the torrent. Verse 16, but the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. 
Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring to those who keep God's commands and hold fast to their testimony about Jesus. Okay, what is going on here? All of this is one symbol after another symbol after another symbol. So let's walk through them. First of all, water always symbolizes the Gentile nations in Scripture. Uh, we see multiple references to it. Uh, Jeremiah 51 verses 12 and 13, for instance, specifically refers to Babylon in reference to its rivers. So water, the ocean, is almost always used as a symbol of the Gentile nations, that they're stirred up like the waters and so on. Uh, also, as we talked about before, the Euphrates River, which was not a barrier to, was not, was not a border to Israel, but was beyond the border of Israel, was a massive river. And the fact that their enemies were mostly on the other side of the Euphrates was a protection for them. So um, crossing the Euphrates was a, a, a dangerous thing. And Euphrates, then the river itself, came to symbolize the heathen nations who were out to get them. So the river became a symbol of the attack upon them. So water symbolizes the Gentile nations. The earth is a symbol of the nation of Israel. After all, when you say the word Israel, you're referring to two things, right? Israel means the people. And Israel means the land. Right? There's a reason why even today there's a dispute about where should our, our embassy be, right? And uh, people who are anti-Jewish won't even refer to Israel as Israel. They'll only refer to it as Palestine, right? So the land is tied to the people very, very, very strongly. They are referred to as people of the land. When God gave them the promise, it was, I will be your people, I will be your God, and I will give you the land. The land has always been tied to the people of Israel. Uh, in fact, in, uh, in Isaiah 62.4, uh, referring to God coming back to his people, it says, your, your land will be married. Right? So the land of Israel and the people of Israel are always tied together. So in symbolic parts of the Bible, water always refers to Gentile nations and the land always refers to Israel. So when you read this with that in mind, Let's go through it again, verses 15 through 17. From his mouth, and that's always a place of speaking, so somehow the Antichrist gives orders. The serpent spewed water, sent the Gentiles, the Gentile nations, like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her with the torrent. So the Gent, a Gent, Gentile nations attack the, the woman, but the earth, that is the land of Israel itself, help the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river. So the land of Israel itself becomes a protection against the Gentiles who want to overtake her. This has already been partially fulfilled within the lifetime of some of you who are watching. World War II, what happened? Before World War II, there were very few Jews living in Israel. Hebrew was not an official language. It was a dead language. World War II happened. What happened then? Gentile peoples, the Nazis specifically, wanted to wipe out the Jewish people. They came in like a flood to destroy the Jews. And what did they do? They were rushed off like eagle wings. Where? To the land, to Israel. They reestablished their nation. They even reestablished their language of Hebrew as the official language of Israel. And today, the physical land of Israel acts as a protection to the Jewish people there. This, again, is why that land, as we saw previously, like right with the dome in, in Jer Jerusalem and everything else, this is one of the reasons why that land is so important and why it is so uh, fought over. That land itself will physically protect God's people during the tribulation, just as it has through many times in history. So what you've got here is a picture of that. The land of Israel will protect the Jewish people during the Great Tribulation. It has before it will happen again. Again, the most recent time that this occurred, and I believe this is the beginning of a fulfillment of these things, was in 1948, after World War II, when, they, when Israel became a nation again in Hebrew, a dead language rose from the dead again and is now the official language and is spoken in the streets of Israel, right? It's something that had never happened before in, in history. Um, the land protected the people. Um, and so today, that's where they are. So uh, you then, so the land, the land. I, I believe that what happened during that season was the beginning of the fulfillment of that. This is, in fact, it was during that season where a whole lot of uh, prophetic preaching began. If you grew up in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, 
you constantly heard second coming sermons. And maybe you even wonder, why aren't there more second coming sermons today? Here's why. It's not that there are fewer today, it's that there were so many when you were growing up. Before that, before 1948, not a whole lot of second coming sermons. It happened just like it happens today, but it wasn't huge. 50s, 60s, 70s, tons of second coming sermons. Why? Because the people alive then had watched as the land of Israel became a protection for the Jewish people, as the nation of Israel became a nation again, as Hebrew was reborn again, and they, every time they turned around, they expected the temple to be rebuilt again. And so they were thinking, this is it. It's going to happen right away. Now, as often happens in prophecy, something occurs, and then there's a long gap before the next segment. But I do believe that what we have seen in some of our lifetimes was the beginning of the preparation for the end times with the, God's people, with the Jewish people, in the land of Israel so that when this happens, they will already be situated in place and they will already be afforded with a certain amount of protection from the land. So that's what this is uh, really all about. So the land of Israel will protect the Jewish people during the Great Tribulation. What we also saw in this passage is that the persecution of new believers in the Great Tribulation will be extremely severe. Take a look at it again in verse 17. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to war against the rest of her offspring. Does that mean all Jews? Yes, but it also means, listen to this, those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. So the persecution during the Great Tribulation will, yes, be focused on Jews, but not just Jews. It will also be against anyone who holds the testimony of Jesus. So Christians as well, those who come to Christ during the Great Tribulation. Again, remember, if you believe as I do in a pre-tribulation rapture, we who are believers now will be taken up, but there will be people during the tribulation who come to know Christ, and they, along with our Jewish brothers and sisters, will be greatly persecuted by the enemy during that time of tribulation. And um, yeah, and that's where we end it for that passage for today. So a lot in there, another one of those complicated things back and forth. Some of you may look at it and go, well, I don't quite see it that way. Good for you. There's so much in there. <laughs> You can have 10 different people and have 20 different opinions on that one. But those are some interesting pictures. I think the basic idea behind it is really solid, right? Obviously, that that figure of the dragon, of the woman and of the child, the dragon is obviously Satan. The woman, the, the child is obviously Jesus. And so what we've got there is a picture of the spiritual battle in the heavens, on the earth and under the earth that has gone on, that is going on, and that will go on until Jesus comes at the Battle of Armageddon and makes it right again. That's a lot for today. Thanks for sticking with me. We'll see you next time.